Hello, year five and year six. Um, Harris here. I'm bringing to you uh, the final lesson of this week's uh, reading of Black Beauty. Um, you'll notice I'm in a slightly different thing. I'm working from home today and I'll let you into a secret. I'm still wearing my pyjamas. Uh, and it's a bit late for that, uh, but I've done lots of work this morning and met the year six teachers on a video call, so it has been busy. Right, without further ado, I will share my screen so we can get this lesson. Um, so I'm going to share my desktop. I understand there's a slight delay, so hopefully now you can see the cover of uh, tea and the uh, We'll start by going through yesterday's true or false question chapter five and six. So there were three people in the Manly family. This is true. It was John, his wife, and they had one child. The squire got to ride the horse first. This was false. It was John. When riding the horse, they started gradually and got quicker. That's true. Uh, and if you did the information to understand, uh, they went from, what was it, a, a trot? a canter to a gallop, being the fastest. Uh, John reported the horse was excellent to ride. That's true. Um, they named, no, they named, they named the, the horse Blackbird. That is false. It's, of course, Black Beauty. And finally, I can start actually using the horse's name uh, because in all my questions, I've been just saying the horse or darky when actually the horse gets called Black Beauty. Um, Black Beauty and Rob Roy are siblings. This is true. Duchess is their mother. Number seven. Some of the men at Squire Gordon's were unkind and treated the horses badly. That's false. All the men were kind there to Black Beauty. Uh, she continued to be ill-tempered with Black Beauty. That's false. In the end, they got on really well. Um, at the beginning of chapter six, the horse was completely content at false, she wanted a bit of liberty, freedom. Sometimes Darkie still had a lot of energy at the end of the day. That is true. She was an energetic horse. Um, John Manley used the reins and whip to calm Darkie down. That's false. He said uh, it was just the tone of his voice. So I'm sure you might be able to relate to that with some teachers who sometimes use the tone of their voice to suggest a change in behaviour is needed. Uh, OK, the questions which can be sent to the email addresses um, I didn't receive any of those unfortunately not in year six maybe in year five it would be great to see some of these things children challenge yourself stretch yourself a bit um, why did Darkie understand about mother being so upset when Rob Roy, Rob Roy died in the hunt well it was the first time the Black Beauty realized that Rob Roy was his brother and that was therefore his mother's son um, Darkie wanted liberty. This is important. What about Darkie's life meant she was not free? Well, um, she was a working horse at all, at all times. So even though she was treated well, she still had to carry out the task for her master. Um, and if you could give the horse, our narrator, a different name, what would it be? Why? Well, there's no co correct reason for that. I thought maybe shadow or nightshade, something like that uh, could be quite interesting. Uh, OK, on, on to... Okay, uh, before we go on to the lesson, there's a few bits of vocabulary. So uh, we hear the term weaned off something. So that's to get used to managing without someone or something. So Ginger got used to not having her mum there. That was weaned off having her mother there. Uh, scarcely, I wrote this one down because uh, we've seen it in Kensuke's King and we thought it, it, that means only barely. So, oh, I barely, I scarcely slept last night. That's Barely, I only had a little bit of sleep. Um, vexed, I like this word, uh, it means annoyed or frustrated, a good synonym for those. And surly means unfriendly. I wonder if we're getting a sense of what the uh, feeling in this chapter might be with words like vexed, scarcely, surly, and weaning off. Um, and there's a couple of technical words there. Spurs, no, not the greatest football team in the world. Well, they are, but also. So a metal tool designed to direct the horse. Okay, you dig it into the side, I think, though I am not a horse rider. And forelock, a uh, lovely lock of hair going just up the forehead. That's what my hair used to look like. Okay, 
we are going to be answering these multiple choice questions. I will go to the text. So children, hopefully now you can see the PDF. I will put a copy of that in the description of the video so you can use it yourself or pause these pages. Sit quietly, sit calmly, relax, and uh, I will begin reading. Chapter 7. Ginger. One day, when Ginger and I were standing alone in the shade, we had a great deal of talk. She wanted to know all about my breaking up and breaking in, and I told her, well, said she, if I had had your bringing up, I might have had as good a temper as you, but now I don't believe I ever shall. Why not? I said, because it has all been all so different with me, she replied. I never had anyone, horse or man, that was kind to me, or that I cared to please. For in the first place, I was taken from my mother as soon as I was weaned and put with a lot of other young None of them cared for me, and I cared for none of them. There was no kind master like yours to look after to me and talk to me and bring me nice things to eat. The man that had the care of us never gave me a kind word in my life. I do not mean that he ill used me, but he did not care for us one bit further than to see that we had plenty to eat and shelter in the winter. A footpath ran through our field, and very often the great boys passing through would fling stones to make us gather. I was never hit, but one fine young colt was badly cut in the face, and I should think it would be a scar for we did not care for them, but of course it made us more wild, and we settled it in our minds that the boys were out. We had very good fun in these free meadows, galloping up and down and chasing each other round and round the field, and standing still under the shade of the trees. But when it came to breaking in, that was a bad time for me. Several men came to catch me. When at last they closed me in at one corner of the field, one caught me by the forelock, another caught me by the nose and held it so tight I could hardly draw my, my breath. Then another took my underjaw in his hard hand and wrenched my mouth open, and so by force they got on the halter and the bar into my mouth. Then one dragged me along by the halter, another flogging behind, and this was the first experience I had of men's kindness. It was all force. They did not give me a chance to know what they wanted. I was high bred and had a great deal of spirit and was very wild, no doubt, and gave them, I dare say, plenty of trouble. But then it was dreadful to be shut up in a stall all day after day instead of having my liberty. And I fretted and pined and wanted to. You know yourself is bad enough when you have a kind master and plenty of coaxing, but there was nothing of that sort for me. There was one, the old master, Mr. Ryder, who, I think, could soon have brought me round and could have done anything with me. But he had given up all the hard part of the trade to his son and to another experienced man, and he only came at times to oversee. His son was a strong, tall, bold man. They called him Samson, and he used to boast that he had never found a horse that could throw him no gentleness in him, as there was in his father, but only hardness, a hard voice, a hard eye, a hard hand. And I felt from the first that what he wanted was to wear all the spirit out of me and just made me into a quiet, humble, obedient piece of horse flesh. Horse flesh. Yes, that is all that he thought about. And Ginger stamped her foot as if the very thought of him made her angry. Then she she went on. If I did not do exactly what he wanted, he would get put out and make me run round with that long rein in the training field till he had tired me out. I think he drank a good deal, and I'm quite sure that the more often he drank, the worse it was for me. One day he had worked me hard in every way he could, and when I lay down I was tired and miserable and angry. It all seemed so hard. The next morning he came for me early, and ran me round again for a long time. I 
scarcely had an hour's rest when he came again for me with a saddle and bridle and a new kind of bit. I could never, never quite tell how it came. He had only just mounted me on the training ground when something I did put him out of temper and he chucked me hard with his rein. The new bit was very painful and I reared up suddenly, which angered him still more, and he began to flog me. I felt my whole spirit set against him, and I began to kick and plunge and rear as I had never done before, and we had a regular fight. For a long time he stuck to the saddle and punished me cruelly with his whip and spurs, but my blood was thoroughly up, and I cared for nothing he could do, if only I could get him off. At last, after a terrible struggle, I threw him off backward. I heard him fall heavily on the turf, and without looking behind me, I galloped off to the other end of the field. There I turned round and saw my persecutor slowly rising from the ground and going to the stable. I stood under an oak tree and watched, but no one came to catch me. The time went on, and the sun was very hot. The fly swarmed around me, settled on my bleeding flanks where the spurs had dug in. I felt hungry, for I had not eaten since the early morning. But there was not enough grass in that meadow for a goose to live. I wanted to lie down and rest, but with the saddle trapped tightly on, there was no comfort, and there was not a drop of water. The afternoon wore on, and the sun got low. I saw the other colts led in, and I knew they were having a good feed. At last, just as the sun went down, I saw the old master come out with a sieve in his hand. He was a very fine old gentleman with quite white hair, but his voice was what I should know him by amongst a thousand. It was not high, nor yet low, but full and clear and kind. And when he gave orders, it was so steady and decided that everyone knew, both horses and men, that he expected to be obeyed. He came came quite long, now and then shaking the oats about that he had in a sieve, and speaking cheerfully and gently to me. Come along, lassie. Come along, lassie. Come on, come along. I stood still and let him come up. He held the oats to me, and I began to eat without fear. His voice took all my fear. He stood by, patting and stroking me while I was eating, and seeing the clots of blood on my side, he seemed very vexed. Poor lassie, it was a bad business, a bad business. Then he quietly took the rein and led me to the stable. Just at the door stood Sam Samson. I laid my ears back and snapped at him. Stand back, back, said the master, and keep out of You've done a bad day's work for this filly. He growled out something about a vicious brute. Hark ye, said the father, a bad-tempered man will never make a good-tempered horse. You've not learned your trade yet, Samson. Then he led me by, by, by my box, took off the saddle and bridle with his own hands and tied me up. Then he called for a pail of warm water and a sponge, took off his coat, and while, while the stable man held the pail, he sponged my sides a good while, so uh, tenderly that I was sure he knew how sore and bruised they were. Oh, my pretty Stand still. His very voice did me good, and the bathing was very comfortable. The skin was so broken at the corners of my mouth that I could not eat. The stalks hurt me. He looked closely at it, shook his head, and told the man to fetch a good bran mash and put some meat. How good that ash was, and so soft and healing to my mouth. He stood by it all the time I was eating, stroking me. And talking to if a high mettled creature like this, said he, can't be broken by fair means, she will never be good for anything. After that, he often came to see me, and when my mouth was healed, the other breaker, Job they called him, went on training me. He was steady and thoughtful, and I soon learned what he wanted. Okay, we'll carry on to chapter eight. Ginger's children, uh, Ginger's story continued. The next time that Ginger and I were together in the paddock, she told me about her first place. After my breaking in, she said, I was 
bought by a dealer to match another chestnut horse. For some weeks, he drove us together, and then we were sold to a fashionable gentleman and were sent up to London. I had been driven with a check rein by the dealer, and I hated it worse than anything else. But in this place, we were reined far tighter. The coachman and his ma- master, thinking we looked more stylish, we were often driven about in the park and other fashionable places. You who never had a check rein on don't know what it is, but I can tell you it is dreadful. I like to toss my head about and hold it as high as any horse, but fancy now yourself. If you tossed your head up high and were obliged to hold it there, and that for hours together, not able to move it at all, except with a jerk still higher, your neck aching till you did not know how to decide that, to have two bits instead of one, and mine was a sharp one. It hurt my tongue and my jaw, and the blood from my tongue coloured the throth that kept flying from my lips as I chafed and fretted at the bits and rain. It was worse when we had to stand by the hour waiting for our mistress at some grand party or entertainment, and if I fretted or stamped with impatience, the whip was laid on. It was enough to drive one mad. Did not your master take any thought for you? I said. No, said she. He only cared to have a stylish turnout, as they call it. I think he knew very little about horses. He left that to his coachman, who told him I had an that I had not been well broken to the check rein, but I should soon get used to it. But he was not the man to do it, for when I, I was in the stable, miserable and angry, instead of being smooth and quieted by kindness, I got only a surly word or a blow. If he had been civil, I would have tried to bear it. I was willing to work, and ready to work hard too, but to be tormented for nothing but their fancies angered me. What right had had they to make me suffer like that. Besides the soreness in my mouth and the pain in my neck, it always made my windpipe feel bad. And if I had stopped there long, I know it would have spoiled my body. I grew more and more restless and irritable. I could not help it. And I began to snap and kick when anyone came to harness. For this, the groom beat me. And one day, as they had just buckled us into the carriage and was straining my head up with that rein, I began to plunge and kick all my I soon broke a lot of harness and kicked myself clear so that was an end of this place after this I was sent to Tattersall's to be sold of course I could not be warranted free from vice so nothing was said about that my handsome appearance and good paces soon brought a gentleman to bid for me and I was bought by another dealer he tried me in all kinds of ways and with with different bits and he soon found out what I could not. At last he drove me quite without a check rein and then sold me as a perfectly quiet horse to a gentleman in, in the country. He was a good master and I was getting on very well but his old groom left him and a new one came. This man was as hard tempered and hard handed as Samson. He always spoke in a rough impatient voice and if I did not move in the stall the moment he wanted me he would hit me above the hocks with his his stable room, or the fork, whichever he might have in it. Everything he did was rough, and I began to hate him. He wanted to make me afraid of him, but I was too high-mettled for that. And one day, when he had aggravated me more than usual, I bit him, which of course put him in a great rage, and he began to hit me about the head with a right. After that, he never dared to come into my stall again, either by heels or my teeth were ready for him. Knew it. I was quite quiet with my master, but of course he listened to what the man said, and so I was sold again. The same dealer heard of me and said he thought he knew one place where I should do. It was a pity, he said, that such a fine horse should go to the bad. Of a real good chance. And the end of it was that I came here not long before you did, but I had then made up my mind that men were my natural enemies enemies i must defend of course it is very different here but who knows how long it will last i wish i could think about things as you do but i can't after all I have... well i said i think it would be a real shame if you were to bite or kick john or james i don't mean to she said 
While they said to me, I did bite James once pretty sharp, but John said, try her with kindness. And instead of punishing me, as I expected, James came to me with his arm bound up and brought me a bran mash and stroked me. And I've never snapped at him since, and I won't either. I was sorry for Ginger. Of course, I knew very little then, and I thought most likely she made the worst of it. However, I found that as the weeks went on, she grew much more gentle and gentle and had lost her the, the watchful, defiant look that she used to turn on any strange person who came near her. And one day, James said, I do believe that Mary's getting fond of me. She quite whinnied after me this morning when I had been rubbing her forehead. Aye, aye, Jim, tis the Burtwick ball said she'll be as good as black beauty by and by. Kindness is all the side physic she wants, poor thing. Master noticed the change too, and one day when he got out of the carriage and came to speak to us, as he often did, he stroked her beautiful neck. Well, my pretty one, well, well, how do things go with you now? You are a good bit happier than when you came to us, I think. She put her nose up to him in a friendly, trustful way while he rubbed we shall make a cure of her, John, he said. Yes, sir, she's wonderfully improved. She's not the same creature that she was. It's the Birtwick ball, sir, said John. This was a little joke of John's. He used to say that a regular course of the Birtwick horse balls would cure almost any vicious horse ball. These balls, he said, were made up of patience and gentleness, firmness and petting. One pound of each to be mixed up with half a pint of common sense and given to the horse every okay that's the end of the chapter children um you've got some multiple choice answers or questions to answer on purple mash you'll find the quiz uh in your to do's um and also an additional task uh can you compare gender's upbringing with the upbringing of black beauty why do you think maybe they appear to have different temperaments after the different upbringing that they had and there's a few sentence starters for you to complete there okay i'm going to stop sharing my screen 23 minute video i think that's long enough uh have a good day everyone keep reading